Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Text for our consideration and meditation this morning is the Gospel reading. It was very well read before. I don't need to repeat the whole thing. Verse 24. Very truly I tell you, Jesus says, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. This is the word of our Lord. In the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, who reveals himself today to be our judge, dear fellow redeemed, if the Lord would give me time, I would waste it. I would waste it by sitting on my nice, comfortable recliner in front of an 84-inch television screen watching Law and Order. <laughs> the original one. The one that went for 18 years. Why? Because I love trying to figure it out. Before they do. You see the crime? Sometimes you get a subtle hint of who may have done it. Usually it's wide open. You watch the detectives go through the work, identifying people who might be guilty suspects, narrowing it down, and then they hand the case over to the district attorney, who then has to somehow convict the individual. And all throughout, I am trying to guess before it is revealed. And you know, in Law and Order, it's always the last two minutes. Is he guilty or not guilty? If he's guilty, what's the punishment? 15 to 25 years? Life without parole? If he's not guilty, how did he get off? Technicality? Or truly an innocent person? And I'll have to admit that since I don't have that kind of time, and my wife is happy that I don't because that means I'm doing other things in the house, I haven't seen all of the episodes. So I can't depend on my memory to help me remember how it turned out. No, each time that I perchance happen to see it, it's like seeing it all over again for the first time. What's the end result? And I'll have to admit that it's probably wise that I do not go a couple miles to the west of here and put money down on a game because I don't do very well. The odds are not in my favor. I am wrong far more than I am right. And usually I miss something really key. Jesus is giving us something that's really key today. Perhaps many of us have not missed it. But maybe we haven't looked at it in this particular reality with this set of eyes. Because the text we have before us from John chapter 5 occurs early in Jesus' ministry. And yet he is willing then to already proclaim that the, the final judgment, the final verdict, is life. I mean, I mean, that's equivalent to the first five minutes of Law and Order already telling us what the answer is, who did it, and how, what he's going to receive for punishment or no punishment. But yet, that's what Jesus does because he's the one who judges. So we dive into John chapter 5, and unfortunately, before we get to the verses that are our text, we kind of need to know the situation a little bit, because otherwise the, the words that Jesus say may not resonate well with us. Yes, we understand his words. It's not that we don't understand the English side of it. But what's the scenario behind it? Well, the beginning of John chapter 5, Jesus heals somebody. Huh, no big news. In fact, throughout the Bible, every time we turn a chapter in one of the Gospels, we find Jesus healing somebody. But this particular day was a problem. Because Jesus healed somebody on the Sabbath. 
He took the holy of holy days, that's what had been set aside by God in the Old Testament as a day of not working, and Jesus worked. Now, the miracle that he performed was pretty incredible. There was this pool in Bethesda that every so often God sent an angel down to move the waters in the pool and whichever person that had some kind of illness would touch the waters first, God provided healing. Now, we don't know how often this happened. We don't know if it's on a regular schedule. All we know is that this pool was surrounded by people. And Jesus came by this pool. And he found an, an, an invalid, a guy who could barely crawl his way. He had, a let, he had a mat right next to him. And Jesus asked him, you want to be healed? And the guy said, well, yeah, look at me. I'm far away. There's so many people in front of me. If the waters ever ripple, I won't get there first. And Jesus said, no worries. I got this. He just told the guy, pick up your mat and go. He did. But once again, Jesus committed an error because he did it on the wrong day. A couple verses later, all of the Jews around this pool saw this man walking. They knew who he was. And they asked him, what are you doing carrying your mat on a Sabbath? And the guy said very simply, well, this guy came up to me. I wasn't moving. He talked to me and I was moving. Later, Jesus catched up to the guy and he said, uh, is this what you want? And he says, yes. And Jesus says, then you go and you sin no more. But the Jews catch up to Jesus. They catch up to Jesus and they begin a set of vile accusations against Jesus making sure that they understand that Jesus knows that what he did, miraculous or not, was done on the wrong day. And what's Jesus' answer? Well, he could have defended himself. He could have said, now, now who are you to talk to me? I'm the one who was there on Mount Sinai when those commandments were given to Moses so he could write them down on the tablets of stone, but he doesn't. He keeps his visible separation from the Father as he explains his role. In fact, what do the words tell us? Jesus says, very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Now, let's not mistake something. Jesus is not distinguishing himself as being a lesser individual. Jesus is not creating a new theology of the Trinity being leveled and layered. No. The Bible very exclusively says throughout the scriptures, and Jesus himself says only one chapter later in John 6, that I and the Father are one. But here... Jesus is setting up a reality. He knows that the people in front of him can only grasp what they have seen. They see him. So Jesus identifies his seen relationship with the Father. They don't see the Father, but they see the Son. And so what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus defends his action. Look, look, it's not me. I'm only doing what the Father told me to do. And then when he defends his action, he ascertains, well, the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. He's just saying, look, I'm being a good son. I'm following what my Father has told me to do. And later on in John chapter 6, he's going to say, yeah, that, that Father is your same Father. We should be on the same page here. Obviously, the Jews weren't. But even as Jesus ascertains, he then also identifies his role. Because in verse 21, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives him life, so even the Son gives life to whom it pleases to give it. Moreover, 
The Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. You see, here as we start to get to the nuts and bolts of the second Sunday of end times when we want to talk about last judgment. But we need this background in order to understand these words clearly. The Son does what He does because the Father has detailed Him to the task. He does not run around randomly doing what He feels is appropriate for that time and effort, no. He does exactly what the Father wants him to do. And here, here, he foreshadows years of work not yet done. When he says that the Father entrusts to him the judgment. That's where you and I start to squirm a little bit. That's where we start to sweat a little bit. Because the truth is, none of us want to be judged. It's bad enough that there are an ubiquitous amount of cameras in today's world. It's bad enough that virtually everything we say or do is recorded for posterity, as I am being taped right now. It is bad enough that you and I in our sinfulness try to hide everything that we know goes against what God demands in his holy and perfect word. But then to realize that every single thing that we have done, that we have said, and that we have thought will be judged and judged by the same individual God who became exactly like us. I mean, how many of us as parents from time to time have been snowed a little bit by our children, especially those older ones? who think that they can use their intelligence to try to connive their reality into something that is accepting to us. And we sometimes do that with God. No, God, you, you, you really don't understand my situation. You don't understand everything that I have gone through. You don't understand what makes me happy. And so God says, okay, you don't think that I understand? I'm going to hand all the judgment over to the one who does because my son Jesus experienced every single thing that you have experienced. My son Jesus left that perfect heaven and became a human individual just like you are human. My son Jesus has faced every single temptation that you have faced from commandment 1 to commandment 10, all of them. And very honestly, he probably faced them with a lot more of the devil's focus and attention than you and I have ever received. And because of that, and in spite of that, God says to that son, you, I want you to be the judge. And so how is the son going to judge? The one who has experienced everything. The one who has endured everything and did it perfectly. How is he going to look at us? I know how I would do it. And it wouldn't be pretty. Because I think you would probably agree with me in your lives as well. I unfortunately tend to look down a little bit and sometimes a lot. On those who undergo the same situation that I am undergoing and don't quite measure up to where I'm at. If I perform this great on a test and someone does lower than me, well, that kind of raises my bar a little. And the same is true if it's the opposite. If I don't do as well as somebody else, I'm diminished. 
If I endure X amount of hours or time in a very bad situation and someone bails out after a few seconds, I look at that individual with not so pleasant eyes. And that's where you and I start to fear. Because the holy, perfect Son of God endured every single temptation the devil could throw his way and never once fell into sin. Never once disobeyed the Father. Never once went sideways. Never once considered an alternate path, but he endured it all and he endured it perfectly. He set the bar up here. And you and I have never, ever even dreamed of hitting that bar. So you and I in fear, look at that son to judge, and we want nothing of it. Until the last verse of our text. Because Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. How's the son going to judge? The son is going to judge based on who you are and what you have done. But not alone. The son is going to judge based on who you are and what you have done in light of the gift of faith he also gives. In other words, those who hear God's word see what the Son has done for them and believe it? The judgment is life. And that goes against who we are. We look at our lives. We look at what we have done. We look at how we have failed up to be the perfect person that God demands of us. The perfect husband, the perfect spouse, the perfect child, the perfect neighbor, the perfect member of a community, the perfect employer or employee. We failed all that incredibly. And not just failed it, we failed it on a daily, hourly, momentarily basis. And yet Jesus says, do you trust me? Do you trust what I've done? Do you believe in the words that I have spoken? Well then, you will not be judged, but you have crossed over from death to life. You see, this is like the worst episode of Law and Order ever written. A person is on screen committing the crime. He is caught immediately. A thousand cameras record it. And it's visibly displayed in court. And yet the prosecuting attorney stands up and says, Do you trust me? Do you believe in me? Because if you do, and I see that, then you are not guilty of all of this evidence that has been displayed in front of everybody. You have crossed over from death to life. Using another wonderfully biblical term, you have been justified. Hopefully you mentioned that last week, Pastor. You have been declared not guilty by your judge, the one who endured everything for you, the one who lived perfectly for you, and the one who, even though he said this, would in two and a half years walk the way of the cross in order to offer his sacrifice once and for all. Not sure of that? Go back to our second reading for today in Hebrews. Because if Jesus' sacrifice wouldn't have been valid, he would have to offer it again and again and again like the Old Testament priest did. But he didn't. Once. And with that one sacrifice, with that one death on the cross, with that one resurrection, 
that very same Jesus, our judge, looks and says, faith, 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 life, life, life. And the beauty of it is, we didn't even work faith in ourselves. Because what does Jesus say? Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. It's God the Father who sends his Holy Spirit to use the words of Jesus to put faith in our hearts. It's God the Father that sends the Holy Spirit to nurture and preserve that faith so that in times of greatness and times of difficulty, you and I still trust Jesus, our judge. And we have that final verdict. Life. You want further proof? Further trust? Further nurturing? Well, those who will walk up here in a little bit and get it in that body and blood, bread and wine, that, that, that's your judge right there. That's him giving you of himself. That's the Holy Spirit strengthening that faith within you. Because right there is judgment. Life. Every time you and I open God's word and hear the words of Jesus, see what he has done for us, and believe it, life. It is the opposite of what we deserve. But it's the gift of God in a judgment. And the great thing is we don't have to wait until the last three minutes of the program. We don't have to guess because usually in guessing we're wrong. No. We are sure that the very son who gave his life for us, who is our judge, sees faith and judges us with a final judgment. You've crossed over from death to life. You have life, eternal life. Amen.